Thanks for the countdown, Austin, and uh, welcome everybody to the work session for the Board of Mayor and Alderman meeting for August the 10th, 2021. Uh, we're going to start out by calling a roll, see who's here. Alderman Barnhill. Here. Alderman Martin. Here. Alderman Schroer. Here. Alderman Speedy. Here. <laughs> Alderman McClendon. Here. Alderman Blanton. Absent. Alderman Peterson. Here. And Vice Mayor Berger. Here. Okay, great. Uh, the next item on the agenda is an opportunity for citizens to make comments for items that are not on the agenda. Uh, our tradition is, is you fill out speaker cards that helps us keep up with who you are and also the correct address and correct spelling of your name. So if you plan to speak on any item tonight, please get that to me immediately because I will not take these after the meeting gets really rolling. So, I don't have anybody speaking on items not on the agenda. We'll now go to item one, which is a resolution 2021-128 to approve a mural at 1543 Columbia Avenue. Monique. Hi. We have oh. a um, mural proposed for 1543 Columbia Avenue, and that's actually the Caliber Collision Facility. Um, the mural will be located on the back of the facility, so it will face the Avondale neighborhood. Um, it has been commissioned by the developer Bristol Development and will be maintained by the HOA. Uh, the artist, Michael Cooper, is here. If you have any questions, he's also the artist that did the Welcome to Franklin mural that we have on Hillsborough Road. Um, and it comes to you with a recommendation for approval from the FPAC, uh, Franklin Public Arts Commission. Great. Any questions from the board? We'll keep rolling along. Now, item two is uh, resolution 2021-81. Uh, a resolution endorse the energy policy guide. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Appreciate that. Um, I've got Dana Coase with me. She is the chair of the Sustainability Commission. She's chaired it for the last four years um, and has done a great job doing that. She's um, an en uh, engineer in the energy sector. The uh, energy policy guide is the first of three that the commission has uh, started to create. Uh, this one's the farthest along. Um, we presented the draft at the February 23rd work session, received a little bit of feedback and made some revisions since that time. So I'm going to turn it over to Dana and let her go through the uh, policy guide. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Mayor and Alderman, Alderman for having us here this evening. Uh, as Andrew mentioned, we presented a draft of this energy policy guide several months ago. It's been several months. If anyone has as good of a memory as I do, I'll, I'll reiterate uh, it, at a high level about the energy policy guide. Uh, as I do that, I would like each of you to think about what your highest priorities might be for us, and you can share those this evening or afterward through email or phone calls with Andrew and I. So the energy policy guide is just that. It's a document to guide the energy related items that the Sustainability Commission should focus on as a group. The plan seeks to make operations, city operations more resilient to, to future cost increases through the use of energy efficiency and renewable energy strategies. And it also seeks to encourage and make it easier for our residents and businesses to adopt energy efficiency practices and alternative energy technologies. So to do this, we've identified nine action items here. They are in no particular order. So the first is, and we went through these in detail a few months ago, so I will just read them off real briefly. Uh, the first is reducing streetlight energy usage in the city of Franklin. Uh, second is related to the new city hall, be involved with uh, conversations related to the design so we can uh, inform renewable energy and energy savings measures as the building is designed. Number three is to perform comprehensive energy audits of all city owned buildings with the focus on reducing energy costs. Number four is to evaluate the, the uh, future uses for the 200 kilowatt solar array. Number five is to perform a uh, comprehensive study of the municipal fleet with a focus on fuel cost reduction. Number six is to evaluate 
the impacts of requiring new residential dwellings to have a 240 volt outlet in the garage for electric vehicle charging. And this is a change from last time. Last time it was, it was more definitive of require the outlet. We've softened the language to say, let's, let's not just go out there and say we're gonna require it. Let's evaluate the impacts of considering a requirement like that. Number seven is to consider updating the Residential Energy Code to 2018 IECC, Energy, uh, International Energy Conservation Code. Uh, again, this is another change. It used to say, make this update. Now it's saying, let's consider updating the Energy Code for residential to 2018 IECC. Number eight is to make the city's sustainability efforts more visible to our residents and businesses, doing that through social media and, and other uh, even conventional media channels. And then last but not least here is to act as an advocate to the state legislature as it relates to uh, energy policies. So those are the nine action items that we have here, again, in no particular order, but we'd love to uh, hear if you have any further feedback, comments, or thoughts on what our highest uh, priority action items should be. Thank you, Dana. I, I'm gonna suggest maybe if we could, uh, if Andrew could fix one of those little doodle pole things so we can move around and just go ahead and rank them, because I think it's gonna be kind of difficult for us to verbalize all that. Uh, tonight, but I'd welcome <coughs> comments from the staff. Uh, we certainly appreciate the great work of Sustainability Commission. I know the vice mayor is on there, and uh, we appreciate that service that y'all are doing and saving us a lot of money in the long run. So, any questions or comments from the board? I would just say that um, I think the Sustainability Commission is doing a great job. We have really robust discussions, and um, I would say that the public needs to know that the reason for the Sustainability Commission is to save money, to use our taxpayer dollars wisely, and to use energy wisely, and not to foolishly implement or look at and implement projects that cost an exorbitant amount of money and, and have small return. We want to invest a small amount of money and have an exorbitant amount of return, just the opposite. So I would just say that, um, for the general public to know that, who might be watching at home and listening, to know that Sustainability Commission's mission <coughs> is um, a mission that helps to use our taxpayer dollars wisely, watch our energy cost, and um, be able to use our money elsewhere where it's really needed. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, you're welcome. Well, thanks so much, Dana. Great report. Keep up the good work. And thanks for your <coughs> chairmanship mm -hmm. there. <coughs> yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. So look for your email where you mm -hmm. can rank those. Appreciate that. Next is the development activity report for FY 2021. And Good evening, Mayor and Alderman. Hope you're all doing well. Uh, I'm here tonight to present an overview of development activity from the past fiscal year, as well as a comparison to previous fiscal years. Uh, so let's dive right in on the first slide. So starting off with total construction valuation within the city, <coughs> there was a total valuation of approximately $456 million invested into the community over the past fiscal year. Uh, this is an overall decrease from the previous fiscal year of right around $100 million and represents a decrease of 18% from that year. Uh, although the total valuation of construction did decrease in the past year, the valuation of residential construction within the city showed strong growth from $211 million, $211 million in, in fiscal year 2020 to $255 million in fiscal year 21, uh, which equals an increase of 21%. Valuation of non-residential construction in the past fiscal year showed a market decrease of $145 million from the previous year uh, which came out to a 42% difference between those two time periods. Moving on to the next slide uh, to talk about dwelling units. Fiscal year 21 saw a total of 738 new units in the city. Out of those 738 new dwelling units, 
Single family dwelling units remain steady at 342 new units with only a very slight decrease from previous fiscal year counts. New multifamily dwelling units made up 239 of that count, which was a decrease of 540 units from the 779 built the year previous. Uh, the development of new townhome units shows noticeable growth over the preceding fiscal <coughs> years, and this trend continued into fiscal year 21 with a total of 232 new townhome units being constructed. Of the fees collected over the past fiscal year, building permit fee collections were approximately $2.3 million, which was an overall increase from the previous two fiscal years. Road impact fee collections in the previous fiscal year totaled close to $4 million, uh, a decrease from the previous of about $3.5 million. Uh, water and sewer impact fee collections totaled approximately $4 million as well, and like road impact fee collections also decreased about half a million from the previous year. Uh, the decrease in collections from these two fees can be attributed at least partially to the large drop in new multifamily dwelling units, uh, which contribute substantially to these funds. Uh, and for the total permits issued in fiscal year 2021, uh, they did show continual growth with a total of 6,310 permits being issued by the BNS department in that year. Uh, so the next slide, please. Uh, so swapping over from the calendar, sorry, swapping over from our fiscal year to a calendar year standpoint for just a moment, uh, we can see that year to year so far, development is remaining consistent with what was shown last year and new multifamily dwelling units have increased substantially. Um, an interesting trend that I had seen while going through this is if you look at that graph at the bottom, um, the total number of new multifamily dwelling units constructed each year does seem to fluctuate greatly or alternate year to year, going from a higher number to a much lower. Um, fiscal year 21 was a lower year, and as you can see from the year-to-date total uh, for multifamily, it appears that fiscal year 22 will continue that trend with a higher number there. Uh, also increases some of our fee collections uh, and just kind of averages out in the end. Uh, so for the final slide, if you don't mind, thank you. Um, I also wanted to bring attention to the building permit map, which is an interactive resource available through franklintn.gov. This map shows locations of permits that have been issued, as well as some brief information on them. And it actually has been upgraded within the past year by the city's GIS team to include additional work types to filter by and now includes historical data from 2004 and going forward. So it's a good resource to have if you're ever interested in if you see something going on and want to know a little bit more. Um, but in closing, uh, growth has remained strong, stronger so in residential and commercial uh, and non-residential, but I do expect to see a greater growth in that in the coming year. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thanks, Alex. Any questions from the board? Like Go ahead, Oliver Martin. Do, do you know whether or not money will become more available for <clears throat> single family homes than multifamily in the near future? Uh, could you explain that a little bit more if you don't mind? Well, you know, we've got a lot of apartments, mm -hmm. lots mm -hmm. of multifamily, and it seems that this that money is easier to borrow to build multifamily than single family homes. <laughs> That's what we hear. Right. Now, is that the truth? That I cannot speak to. I, I don't know the, the lending practices for that. Um, I'm happy to look into it further, though, if you'd like. We would like to see more sing single family homes, mm -hmm. but it's a my understanding that that's <coughs> not, that those funds are not that's as true. available as for multifamily. Mm -hmm. Alderman, yep. I'm not sure it's so much availability of funds that it, as it is the profit that can be made from one product versus the other. Oh, that's kind of the same thing. I mean, you can get the money well, to do I mean, either. It's the choice that the that developers are making about that's not the profitability. Mm -hmm. that's, that's not what we hear. It's easier to get funding. Well, I would stand by my <laughs> statement. <laughs> <laughs> I would speak All to right. that. Go ahead, Vice Mayor. Um, if you're talking about private investment money, yes. But if you're talking about loans, it's easier to get a loan for the multifamily um, than it is, um, but, but people can actually put investor money to that and make that happen. Um, the percentage 
whoever wants to answer this, the percentage of approved multifamily over in the hopper I'm talking about approved the percentage of multifamily versus the percentage of single family is what is that percentage I think we talked about that just recently and it's like 11 percent versus annual pre, development pre, plan has that I don't know if we yeah. have that even if it's not the exact number. Yeah, so the approved housing not yet built from that annual development report uh, does show apartments at 54% of approved dwelling units uh, and shows single family as 11. Yep. Uh, that would bring the future build out of existing plus approved housing <coughs> for apartments who eventually have 30% of the market share, I guess you could say, in single family to uh, drop to 46% mm -hmm. total. And I believe the total units was over 5,000 units, apartment units uh, so yes mm -hmm. so I'm glad we're talking about this because this is my problem this is the problem of our constituents mm -hmm. we're talking about this all the time and the buck stops at this board and we're gonna have to um, step up to the plate with that but thank you for this um, report I really appreciate it and I I think we need to um, study this with um, bigger thank you, thank you. appreciate it Go ahead, Alderman Barnhill. As I've sat and listened to this, I, I wonder. I, I'm, I'm wondering what the buck is that stops here at the board. Mm -hmm. I mean, do we just stop approving apartment buildings and hope that somebody okay. comes through and approves a, or presents a single-family unit that they want to develop? What is it that we are looking for? Do you know? I don't know. Mm -hmm. What do we? What percentage? Is there, is there a percentage out there in the in the uh, sky someplace that we look for that we want? Uh, and I have no problem with a single family unit being more than what it is. But it, uh, I, what happens on this right here is, what is built is what is market driven. It's what people want. People want that particular lifestyle. If they don't want to move into an apartment, that apartment is not going to be built. Now, whether or not that's the right approach or the wrong approach or whatever it is, but as far as the buck stopping here, unless we put some kind of moratorium on that on apartments, which <laughs> I'm I'm afraid that's not going to work, we are we are in a market driven economy here. And, and when we look back in the paper and we see every one of these companies that is coming out of California and coming out of someplace else, moving in and they're bringing in 100 jobs here and 50 jobs here and 75 jobs here, and we've got 60,000 people coming out of the out of the county into Cool Springs to work on an annual, on a daily basis. Somewhere, somewhere that has to be some accommodation for those people to live if they want to live here, work here, walk to the restaurant, walk to work, and I mean, I, I mean I'm not suggesting that, that we just smother us with apartments, but I am su <laughs> suggesting to you that, that I'm not, I, I don't know what the buck stops here means. <clears throat> okay, we'll keep moving on. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Alex, good job. Uh, Williamson County Growth Plan Update. Good evening, Board of Mayor and Alderman. So I just wanted to give, take a few minutes to give you a little bit of an update on the Williamson County growth plan process <coughs> that we've undertaken over the last several months um, from a local standpoint to start looking at um, our urban growth boundary. So it's the city of Franklin along with Williamson County, Brentwood, <coughs> Fairview, Nolansville, Spring Hill, and Thompson Station. We're all working together to update the Williamson County Growth Plan, which was originally adopted in 2001, and it hasn't been altered since. So just a little background on growth plans in Tennessee. It's a state-mandated countywide plan, and it establishes urban growth boundaries for all the municipalities, planned growth areas within Williamson County, and rural areas within Williamson County. Um, the TCA prescribes the procedures for amending 
uh, the county's growth plan, and it's fairly detailed in what's required during that process. And this slide shows you the existing county growth plan. The lighter shaded areas or the lighter colored areas were the city limits at the time that the growth plan was adopted. And the various colors represent the various municipalities. We're there obviously in the center in the orangish yellow color. And it's a little hard to tell the mapping capabilities back in 2001 weren't quite where we are today. So it's a little difficult, but you can see some planned growth areas identified. Um, in the northern part of the county and the eastern part of the county, if you really were to get close. But I do anticipate that there will be some changes um, with all the various boundaries as we go through this process. Um, this is uh, in the blue, the Franklin urban growth boundary as it exists today, and the yellow is our current city limits. As you all know from the various items you've looked at and considered over the last five or six years, our annexation requests have been varied in type. We have some satellite annexations that have happened down Lewisburg Pike where we have some little islands of city limits. We also have annexed outside of our urban growth boundary down in the Goose Creek area. A lot of this is fueled by changes to state law in 2015. Um, that make annexation property owner driven. And additionally, with the annexation down in Goose Creek, that has been identified as an area where we have utilities, we have infrastructure, we have availability to serve those properties, even though they're not in our urban growth boundary today. So there's a lot of reasons why this is really good time for us to start looking at what um, areas we want to grow to in the future and what makes sense from an infrastructure and public services standpoint. So just generally, the process of amending the growth plan is that each municipality within the county and the county itself um, has to go through certain technical studies as well as certain public outreach obligations at the beginning of this process. <coughs> and after all those tasks are completed, a letter is sent uh, that triggers to the county mayor that triggers the coordinating committee. So some of the um, actual things that we have to do, I'm about to get into with the um, state law requirements and the next slide. I'm not gonna read through each one of these, but in general, this is for you to look back through. The urban growth boundaries should be reasonably compact, yet <coughs> sufficiently large enough to accommodate the residential and non-residential growth over the next 20 years. It should be identified territory that's contiguous to our existing boundaries and that's a logical extension of our services and infrastructure and sustainable over time. Um, it's that territory that a reasonable and prudent person would project as the likely site of high density residential, industrial, or um, commercial growth over the next 20 years. And it's where the municipality is better able and prepared than other municipalities to efficiently and effectively provide urban services. And then lastly, it's really looking at those environmentally sensitive areas as well and the impact that the city and the urban um, extension of, ur of the urban area into those, um, what impact that would have over time. So these are the things that we are all keeping in mind as we're going through this process to make sure that we're really going by these guidelines. From a procedural standpoint, the city does conduct two public hearings. Um, it also must develop and report on population growth projections. And the big one here that's really the driver of what we're looking at as an internal working group is to determine and report the current cost and projected cost of core infrastructure and our services and public facilities that would be necessary to facilitate development into our urban growth boundary and our current municipal boundary. So we're really going, um, as staff, looking at all of these things. Um, we're examining the impact that we would have on environmentally sensitive lands. We're looking at land uses over time that are projected through Envision Franklin and really seeing what makes sense and is fiscally sustainable over time for growth over the next 20 years. 
So if you go to the next slide, what does this all mean for us? Well, over the summer, the city has an internal working group with staff from the water and sewer department, engineering, parks, planning, fire, and administration. And what we've been doing is we've been doing a technical analysis to start with. And we've been looking at each drainage basin. We have 10 in our current uh, urban growth boundary right now. And so each week we look at one or two basins. We look at the cost of it, extending infrastructure into those basins. We look at the land uses projected for the basins, see how that all adds up to help make a technical determination on, on that side of it. We do have community outreach that's gearing up here in August and September that's gonna further guide this whole process and how that boundary eventually evolves. We have a public meeting virtually on Thursday night this week, August 12th at 6 p.m. and the link is available on the city's website, especially if you go to www.franklintn.gov, I hope I said that right, yep. slash UGB. That's the big part to remember. <coughs> um, and then we'll be following up um, after all of our public outreach with presentations to g gather more feedback from the Planning Commission and Board of Mayor and Aldermen. And that then will, we will be able to tell you if there are any changes um, to the UGB that result through that process. So as I said, there's the website where you can get more information. Um, I mentioned that we have our kickoff meeting this week. We do expect that we will have a follow-up of a presentation similar to the kickoff meeting at the August 26th joint workshop, where we can also hear feedback from the Board of Mayor and Aldermen and Planning Commission. And then we're planning a second community meeting here at City Hall in person on September 21st to gather input um, specifically on a proposed um, kind of boundary at that time, just initial draft, getting that feedback that we would need to help evolve that through this process. By all means, this is still a gathering stage. Everything is still evolving through all of these meetings. And we look forward to having the public involved throughout the process. It's um, very open and welcome to receive comment at any point. Andrew Orr is really spearheading this from a technical side with planning. Um, and he and I are both available at any point if anyone from the public would like to speak to us. And we'll follow up with that week with open office hours in September with another joint conceptual workshop in September. And then lastly, one thing I wanna mention is that Williamson County is planning a growth um, plan symposium where they're bringing in speakers from various other municipalities and regions to speak about how they've come together to look at growth planning. And they have identified that date, I think just yesterday, they set the date for October 19th. I don't have the time, but I expect that it'll be in the morning that day. Um, and they're planning to have that in person, um, most likely at the Enrichment Center, but I'm not incredibly sure on the location yet either. I think at the theater, at adjacent the theater. to the Enrichment okay. Center. Gotcha, perfect. So that was a very, I was trying to move through it kind of quickly for you. I know you have a lot of planning items on tonight's agenda. So um, I'd love to hear any, any questions you have or if you um, have any comments you'd like to make. A good job with that, Emily. I'll just chime in a couple things to just emphasize for you. This process has not formally begun. This is the informal process that leads up to it. So we really want that to be informed early on by uh, getting the public to understand the process and give us feedback, do as much um, technical staff work to gather data to help inform those discussions and ultimately decisions that will be made. And this process will really start sometime next year in, in, for, in a formal sense. So uh, this, this part really helps to start the dialogue in the community set some, some questions out there for people to think about and give us feedback. And, and uh, as you see, there's a, a number of opportunities for you all to engage and ultimately you'll be uh, giving approval and, and making a submittal back to the, 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 the growth plan group and, and, and what is submitted is ultimately approved by the board. So that will happen 
in the process, the formal process next year. So uh, this is the start of it. We encourage folks to plug in and be involved. Uh, there are three interesting communities involved in this growth symposium that have been through some interesting growth, uh, growth uh, scenarios that, that we think uh, can be uh, instructive in the county planning department has helped identify those. That includes uh, Wake County, North Carolina, which is the Raleigh area. Um, I believe uh, Buford County, South Carolina, which is Hilton Head and Buford City uh, in South Carolina. And then Chattanooga with its 16 county, three state region has done a long-term uh, growth plan as well. All of which, you know, none of them exactly parallel us, but there's all of them have something that we can look back on and learn from. And so I think that'll be very uh, helpful to, to us, to the community, uh, and to the, to the growth plan group that is working on this. So open it up for any questions you all have. Go ahead, Alderman Bonhill. What kind of questions have you gotten so far from the public? Well, we really haven't begun our huge public outrage part at, the, at this uh, stage. Our first public uh, kickoff meeting is on Thursday night. So that's when we're really going to be reviewing what this is, what this process entails, the timeline for the process, which is intended to really run through um, it, this summer through next summer, um, essentially. So we haven't begun that big push of public outreach at this portion in this stage in the game. Um, in fact, our internal working group has really just started an, a, any technical analysis. Um, so we've really just in the very beginning stages. When we did this the last time, I think it was, uh, there was eight different uh, areas divided up each of the aldermen had one of the areas and then what they did was meet with some of the constituents and mm -hmm. some of the people who were not constituents who lived outside of the urban growth boundary is that what you're looking at this time or you're looking at something different well since we have an existing growth boundary today i don't anticipate the magnitude of the changes to be such that it may warrant as intensive of an approach but we're happy to look at doing something in that way i do think we could identify the areas of the city that we would anticipate there being more um, public input from those undeveloped areas that still remain in the UGB would be the ones I would expect the most input from. There are obviously many of our drainage basins that are already fully built out. Um, and because they're in the center of the urban growth boundary, I wouldn't anticipate changes in the, in the middle of the core. Um, so we haven't really considered that, but we'll definitely take that into consideration and think through that and see if that, that might be something we want to ad adapt into this process. And one of the key things in the process is to look at especially infrastructure, drainage basins, and other transportation planning that is in place and, and try to align those. Because you see especially on the, the fringes, we see that in the southeast where it doesn't really match the drainage basin and that's why you've seen some folks by referendum asked to come into the city because it makes sense to receive those services and by the same token there's some areas that are extremely difficult to serve those may not make sense to continue to hold in your urban growth boundary so you may look at some shifts but really should be guided by uh, the ability to serve and provide in okay. key infrastructure Great and so that is what you'll see from some of this work and then that'll give you and the public something to respond to as the process evolves that was going to be my question um that uh do we anticipate shrinking some of the areas and extending some other areas poss possibly we could i guess to both possibly <coughs> anything is is mm -hmm. up to change at yeah. this point so one of the things i would probably be uh, interested to know is if we shrunk an area or extended an area um just let me speak to Mays creek because that's my district so Mays creek basin how do we obtain the information we need to make the decisions on the ugb uh if we haven't done a full-blown Mays creek basin study to have all the information we would need because we wouldn't extend that area right now because of the sewer is not there and it's really tough. Like Eric said, there's some areas that are tough to serve. But 
does that mean 25, 30 years from now we wouldn't be serving that area? So how do we how do we make those decisions if we don't do a full blown study on the basins? Well, right now we're really looking at the information that we have. So we did do some public outreach, not only through Envision Franklin, but when there were some proposals in the Mays Creek area, we did some individualized outreach at that point. And we do have a good, I think, understanding as staff of what the majority of citizens who came out and spoke and provided feedback wanted for the land use vision in the area. Um, And it quite honestly was lower density than what some proposals would most likely come in for that would pay for the infrastructure to be extended because it is a very high cost to extend the sewer. So we're contemplating how those balance out with every area of the city and going in and looking at them in an individual basin by basin uh, analysis. But what we're having to do is really look at those land uses that seem to be the desired land uses from the public and seeing how they align with the cost of the extension of infrastructure and see if that's sustainable for both the developer and the city in the long term. And and also in the Mays Creek area, we're getting a four lane divided road all the way eventually to Triune, uh, out to Wilson Pike now and then all the way to Triune. So that putting a four lane divided road out there I, I wonder how we're going to look at that mm-hmm. along with the survey along with the sewer basin because that that sort of changes things as well in that area it does and when you mentioned earlier would area shrink or grow and while we don't know that mm-hmm. there is the ability through this process to also work hand in hand with the county and they also get planned growth areas and they have rural areas that they can identify so it does allow us in areas where it may not make the most financial sense to extend infrastructure to talk about coordinating on a land use planning effort together if we wanted to do that. I don't know that that's something that we envision doing necessarily at this point, but at least through the identification of planned growth areas and rural areas, it allows us not only to look at our UGB, but on the periphery of our UGB, it allows us to look at what the county has planned there and see how that aligns with us and our boundary and where those edges are. Can you also identify, uh, my last question, uh, can you also identify in the UGB, um, outside the UGB, let's put it that way, where um, there are some areas of land that come under their new edict of five, one house per five acres, one dwelling per five acres, but there are some that come in under one per one. They'll and be some looking, of those are hard to identify. Yeah, are, they'll be looking at that through this process somewhat with their planned growth area identification versus the rural area. Um, and then they will most likely be going through and looking at that more comprehensively with their, their planning updates from that point forward. Just like us, um, as we identify this urban growth boundary through this process, we're going to have to come on it with uh, immediately after with an update to Envision Franklin. So I would envision all the other municipalities in the county and the county probably sure. needing to do a similar effort. I'd be very interested to identify where it applies <coughs> one per acre, one per acre, where, it, and then where it starts out to apply one per five. And we're working really closely with the county to help understand all of that. Yeah, I'd like to be able to see that in some of these meetings. Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay, we'll keep moving on. If it's okay, we'll go to uh, items five, six, seven, which are plan of services, annexation, and zoning for uh, property long lane at uh, 4325 Long Lane. Thank you and good evening. Uh, The subject property is requesting annexation into the city. It is located within the Goose Creek drainage basin. It is within the UGB currently, and um, it is contiguous to the city limits. Um, The full plan of services is available for you to view as an attachment if you'd like to. Uh, Staff recommends approval um, of all three of these items, and Planning Commission recommended approval unanimously, unanimously as well. Happy to answer any questions. Keep moving along. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, we'll now go to item uh, eight. Uh, adopting a plan of services for the annexation of uh, 4432 Pratt Lane outside of the southeastern part of the Franklin Urban Growth Boundary. And um, let's see, is that items 8, 9, and 10, Joey? Yes, sir. Yeah, let's, let's go with 8, 9, sure. and 10. Uh, so this uh, property owner is requesting annexation into the city. Um, it is, however, outside of the UGB, so it is annexation by referendum. The full timeline of that referendum is available as an attachment. Uh, the property is located within the Goose Creek drainage basin um, and does help to fill a hole that uh, from previously annexed property into the city. Um, so staff does recommend approval of all three, three of these items. Uh, Planning Commission also recommended approval unanimously. Happy to answer any questions. Where's that relationship to the last property? Because it's not coming up on my, I can't the, see. The one I just discussed? Mm -hmm. It's south, uh, it's basically right across from the Reams Fleming property. This is? Yes, this is. Right. So the previous property is actually out of the shot from um, up, up above. Street. It's above, above, yes. Yeah. It's, a long, long, it's a long, long lane. And so, mm -hmm. Between, I can't, it, it won't North load. of the Ag Center. It won't lay yeah. load, so I can't see it, but I'm just, yeah, it says failed free try. So I, I just wanted, um, so the, all the purple area is the current yes. UGB? Current That's city limits. limits. Um, or city limits. Yes. And then point to that property right now. Who, yeah, right there, the first one. So it's all within it right now. Okay, thanks. Do, I got it. Do you do you have the history as to why it was not annexed? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The property owner just did not request annexation yeah. uh, when the previous two mm -hmm. large groups of properties came in. So more more fun for us. <laughs> that's that's a good enough historical. Uh, analysis. <laughs> Item 11, Consideration Ordinance 2021-29, an ordinance to adjust boundaries of the hillside hillcrest <coughs> overlay uh, for the property located south of Mackatcher Parkway and east of Franklin Road at 354 Franklin Road. Thank you. As a reminder, the uh, hillside hillcrest overlay district is intended to protect the city's hillsides and hillcrests including their natural and topographic character and identity, environmental sensitivities, aesthetic qualities, and views shed by limiting the development and preventing overly obtrusive uses within the overlay. Uh, the property consists of approximately 200 acres and is located uh, at the corner of Franklin Road and Mackatcher Parkway uh, within close proximity to Roper's Knob. Um, the proposed HHO line fails to protect uh, the existing tree line, particularly on the eastern portion of the property along Mac Hatcher, and does not meet the intent and purpose of the HHO um, overlay. It was apparent to staff while we did our various site visits that the base of the hill fell along the existing tree lines. Uh, therefore, staff believes that moving the HHO beyond the tree line would allow for the potential of the tree line to be removed and for more development to be built at a height that would begin to block the view shed of both um, the, this area as well as Roper's Knob from Franklin Road. Uh, therefore, staff does not support the proposed restructuring of the HHO line for this property, and the uh, Planning Commission recommended disapproval unanimously. Happy to answer any questions. Go ahead, Dana. I've got Go ahead, Dana. Alden, Clinton. Um, how exactly was the HHO boundary on this property established in the first place? I believe it was based on a contour line. Um, I don't know the exact history of the uh, establishment of the HHO. Like Joey, I was not here at the time, but from my understanding, it was a combination of 
a um, a group that went around and did a view shed analysis and a scenic kind of survey of the property and what could be seen from the roads, the major arterial roads, in combination with tree canopy retention and um, or tree canopy cover, and the actual slope analysis of the property at the time. And then it also had to do with the contours and based how they sat from adjacent roadways and properties. That's my understanding. I, my questions are not intended to be to suggest some invalidity, but when we make rules, my preference is that we make rules that have some um, objective or clear origin. And I think what I heard you say was that people drove around and looked mm -hmm. at yep. what you could see from one place and another. That was a portion of the analysis, yes. It wasn't the only sole. So part of it. in part, we are regulating what a person can do on their property based upon what can be seen from their property or what can be seen on their property from other property. Well, the intent of the HHO when it was adopted was not only to protect the hillsides um, in, with their own environmental sensitive kind of status, but also to project the view shed of what the entire community would see from adjacent properties and um, roadways and for the entire community to enjoy. But it, it was developed in leaving developable area as well at the base of the hill. Okay. So. So I've been on this property, and from parts of this property, you can see to Hillsborough Road. Is that in part why the HHO is where it is on this property? I can't be specific about it. I'm, I apologize. I just wasn't here for the actual part I, of that part. I'm, of I'm, we, as I recall, when we did this ordinance, part of what we did was pick a, a an angle of incline or a, a, a slope percentage that we would regulate and prohibit development on, right? Yes. And we have the records and all of this. It's just I don't have the full technical knowledge of everything that went into the study. That's so. a knowable number that we can yeah. replicate, right? Yes. Like if we say you're not going to develop on a slope greater than whatever, 15%. You, you can know that number and and you can go out and see it where it is, right? Yes, sure. But when we start adopting a regulation and then refusing to reconsider its application based upon, well, what can I see from here? It becomes a little more subjective, don't you think? Well, it has to do with a number of different factors. So I, I haven't, you know, I'm not sure exactly what the question is, I guess, but um, ultimately it's a combination of all those various factors, which we can look up and provide to you. Um, we do have the records of all of those and it is based on the slopes, but in combination with the view shed analysis that was performed as well as the the protection of, of the trees and the protection of the ultimate very hilltop itself because that's where you also then see where there's not slopes. Right. Um, well, as I understand it in this case, the applicant, the request was not to ignore that there was an HOA. It mm -hmm. was to... To amend. It was to, it was to pull it back mm -hmm. to an area that permitted some development while recognizing from their perspective sure sure that there were slopes and trees and view sheds that should be protected so the and the difference in some cases at least when i walked around on the property didn't it wasn't immediately apparent to me what why the hho line as it existed mm -hmm. was obvious or obviously better than where it might be moved if their request were approved. I, I mean, and I'm just, I, I, I tend to gravitate toward rules that are knowable in advance 
and defensible under scrutiny. And when you walk out on this property, some of the places that our HHO line wound up being are, are maybe not where reasonable people would go out and put them today if the idea was to protect tree canopies and slopes, environmentally sensitive areas, and view sheds. Because honestly, there's parts of this property that are developable without a change that are gonna, that would permit the, the, you could see the buildings from Hillsborough Road. I mean, if we were really all about not doing things that you could see from a long way away, we wouldn't have done Iron Horse at all. You can see that from Mac Hatcher and Hillsborough Road. From the church. Right? And yet that didn't have, that didn't trigger any HHO protection. I guess what I'm saying is I, I just, I walked around on this property and I saw the stakes where the, literally the stakes, where the HHO line exists. And I don't, if the developer gets no relief, well that, you know, okay, whatever. But that's not gonna prevent intrusion or, or development where there's view shed issues. And I'm not even sure that that line where it exists in certain places on this property makes a whole lot of sense to me given what the policy objectives were. <clears throat> Did I miss something, or is this something that reasonable people can disagree about? I mean, I think everybody has their own interpretation of where the line should be. I think that's kind of my problem. That that is a that is a problem. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a problem. Huh? Any other questions, I'm, Mayor? Yeah, yeah. Go, ahead. go ahead, Alderman Barnhill. You know, it's a it's it's contrary to whatever that we set an ordinance based upon what somebody likes without having some means to do to to justify that and if you want to do you can go back out there and you take a 705 foot elevation if you wanted to and you could draw your contour or you could draw your hhh mo line there if you wanted to you could do something there that makes that and what you're talking about is is basically 14 acres on that 200 acre piece of property. What the the uh, the line runs through a barn, <coughs> does it not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it does. It runs through. It runs. It actually runs, folks. It actually runs through a barn. It runs through a, uh, a, a, a crab apple or whatever row of trees that are absolutely nothing but just scrub trees. And the comment is well. We like those trees. Well, that's not justification for putting that line there. There's plenty, there's open spaces there that that comes in and the line takes up those open spaces. If you went back out there and again, like I said, if you take up, you can take anything you want to. You can take 690 feet if you want to. You can take 705, you can take 730 and have some justification for that line and how it's drawn and what it's supposed to do on that then. If it's a 15% slope, then it, it, you, you don't you don't do that. It it carves it out. There'll be some de there'll be some deviations from it, but the thing about it is, when you said at the very beginning, a group of people went out there and looked at it and decided what it should be. <laughs> well, uh, that makes it awfully difficult for somebody like me to justify why that line is there yeah. <laughs> because somebody liked it. I mean, I might like something else. I'm Again, it if. was a combination of various factors, and I apologize if I made that the... No, and, and this board yeah. established it yeah. through the zoning ordinance. I just I, want to make I sure they're clear yeah, on I'm that. Not, this isn't I'm not, somebody, not, this is us. Yeah. Okay. Not, not, <laughs> right. not argue. Before I recognize okay. uh, the vice mayor... I know it's been a long time. <laughs> been a long time. <laughs> yeah. Before I recognize the vice mayor, I think my question, a, a quick comment would be that maybe we need to better understand the process that you go through with some examples of how you reach the uh, these number these lines, I think that would help us because when we're out there in the field and looking at little flags, you know, sure. we, we just need more information and yeah. more and understanding we'll of the, the process. So uh, I think I would suggest maybe we get this to a workshop where we can have some time okay. to discuss it, and I would urge uh, everybody to attend that workshop uh, to make sure that 
they get the information at that time. Either that or we could do it at a work session in mm. the future. Sure. So uh, go ahead, Vice Mayor. Well, I would recommend the workshop. Uh, are we going to hear from, yeah, right? I mean, I'd like to hear what you have to say in a minute, but I, I would you like. go ahead and I'll recognize uh, him and I have a speaker oh, sure. also in the uh, audience. Okay. I, I would like to actually have that workshop on site because honestly, here I go again, practicality and logic. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> all the time, <clears throat> let's go back to practicality and let's go back to logic. And when I saw the property, because I like to protect the hillside, don't get me wrong, I'm adamant about that. But when I saw the HHO line run through a barn and also include a very flat old football field, I'm like, this can't be in the HHO line. It's all piece of flat, I'm down in the gully almost on a flat piece of land. And yet, I'm seeing that that's where the HHO line is. I'm thinking this is not practical or logical and, you know, agree with uh, Clyde on that. So, yeah, I think if we do have a, a workshop on it, I would like for us to go on site because I don't know how planning commission can make a vote when they've never seen it. You, you can look all day on this map. These colors mean nothing. This is a flat piece of paper you need to go look at it because it changes your perspective. It changes the way you look at things. So that would be my comment. Well, I would, I would ask the staff to uh, uh, have the workshop. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not particularly decided whether it should be on site or not because I think there's a lot of ways they could demonstrate a lot of other examples. And surely we have some, some computer pictures. model. I don't, I don't want, well, I don't really care anymore, but the board probably doesn't <laughs> want to be setting up field trips every time this kind of thing comes up. Well, so we don't uh, wanna, we don't what, what's yeah, your video. plan, Mr. Gamble? What, what? Yes, I had planned a presentation tonight. We're certainly willing to do a workshop uh, with BOMA and Planning Commission. Mm -hmm. And um, I've discussed with my client, they're willing to defer tonight's first reading. Um, until a uh, point after the, the workshop would be fine. Everybody good with that? Do I need to request deferral it, at the it, voting <laughs> meeting tonight, I'm assuming? Yeah. I, I'm it's good on at the seven o'clock. You can set a date if you'd like. I mean, we'd need tonight. to probably huddle a little oh, bit about oh. the timing. Yeah, no problem. I, I'm okay with it, but I, I don't know what the aversion is to actually going on site and looking at something because because then you'll be making field trips all over the city well, we have. every month. We no, well, no, but but we'll uh, work out whether it's but on have fun. site visit. Sure, but, but some if of it is going to have to be with a screen. If it's not on site, then nature. bring us some uh, pictures. Yeah. Bring us a video or some pictures so we can actually see it. Because maybe some of these, some of us have been out there. Hopefully, all of us have been out all there. So. Market. We are talking about Roper's Knob, aren't we? This is a property directly yeah. adjacent to Roper's Knob. Yes. Um, Roper's it is property that's currently owned by Mr. Kelly. Yes. Uh, the dispute is not about the preservation of the hillside, hilltop, um, or slopes that are greater than 20%. The discussion is about the location of the line as it kind of meanders up and down certain topographic features. All right, and let's remember that there are people who live out there that have been living their lives being told that they would not lose that tree line behind them. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of things to consider. That it's was a not that there's a piece of land you could build on. I had planned for that to be a part of the presentation tonight, but uh, Mayor, in light of the conversation about the work session, we'll hold off on a presentation. Thank you. We've got a public comment from Alan Sims. <coughs> Sims you got two minutes. Okay. Good evening. My name's Alan Sims. I live at 119 Lewisburg Avenue. Talk into that thing. Oh, I'm sorry. Alan Sims, 119 Lewisburg Avenue. Um, I was, until you deferred it, um, I just wanted to come and say that um, you have a good staff and you've got commissions and they've actually spent some time and reviewed all this stuff. And so I would urge you to follow their recommendation. <laughs> That's all I want to say. Thank you. Items uh, 12, 13, 14. Uh, have to do with rezoning of 61.80 acres from a state residential district to 
PD 2.61 for property located uh, south of Mac Hatcher and east and west of Franklin Road. And there's also a development plan and an impact fee and construction agreement. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, the applicant is proposing a new planned unit development known as Emmeline or Emmeline Acres, I'm not sure which one pronunciation, uh, for the property east and west of Franklin Road and south of Mac Hatcher. This is different from the property we just discussed in the previous item. Um, and the proposed <coughs> development consists of 33 single family lots and 32 multiplex mm -hmm. buildings with four units per building for a total of 161 dwelling units. Uh, it consists of 61 acres. Envision Franklin places uh, this area into the conservation uh, subdivision uh, design concept, which states that a new development should preserve a minimum of 50% open space and that these areas generally have higher quantities of environmental resources in rural areas or along the periphery of, of the city that are desired to be preserved. Um, Envision Franklin further gives special consideration for new development in this area around the Franklin Road Mac Hatcher intersection and, and identifies Franklin Road as the last rural gateway into downtown Franklin. It also serves as the entrance to the Franklin Road Historic District that exemplifies the transition from rural to urban settlement through historic resource, resources that are listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, as such, Envision Franklin recommends that uh, the form of architecture and style of new buildings should draw from the surrounding area and from historically significant buildings. The height of new buildings should be no taller than the nearby historic resources. Uh, the plan as proposed provides narrow, narrow lots that are incongruous to the rural nature of the area with smaller lot widths leading to building forms that accentuate heights rather than width. Um, there are no lots narrower than 56 feet that currently face uh, this area or this section of Franklin Road. Uh, additionally, the longest run of existing lots in a row in this area is only seven lots. And these area uh, are a combination of lots under 100 feet wide and over uh, 100 feet wide. Uh, the existing lots, excuse me. Uh, no lot being proposed with this plan that fronts Franklin Road is wider than 100 feet. Uh, the plan as proposed is not compatible with what has been built in the surrounding area. Additionally, the long side porches uh, that, are, that have been provided as conceptual architecture are not typical of the Middle Tennessee vernacular and are more associated with uh, Coastal Carolina, so they're not really com uh, compatible with the surrounding architecture. On June 14th of this year, the Historic Zoning Commission gave a preliminary recommendation of disapproval based on their findings that the proposed development is not designated to preserve or designed to preserve the rural context of the Franklin Road corridor, which is the last gateway into downtown Franklin with its historic context still intact. A full summary of their recommendation of disapproval is included as an exhibit. Uh, additionally, the four lots facing Mac Hatcher, specifically lots 11 through 14, do not meet frontage requirements as all new single family and multiplex buildings must front onto a public road and these lots are designed to front onto a muse alley, which is not uh, permitted. Uh, these lots must be removed, and if they cannot be reworked into the overall layout, the applicant will need to reduce the number of multiplex buildings in order to maintain the single family housing as the primary use uh, per Envision Franklin. Uh, lastly, the street layout as designed, specifically the connection to the cul-de-sac would require additional access easements from the church property uh, that is neighboring church property that have not yet been granted, uh, at least at the time of the uh, planning commission. There is a modifi modification of standards with this request or this, with this uh, development to extend the maximum length of a muse alley from 800 feet to 965 feet uh, because these standards were just created with the most recent <coughs> zoning ordinance update. Staff recommends disapproval of this modification of standard. Um, so with all that in mind, staff does recommend disapproval of the uh, M-Line Acres PUD subdivision and its subsequent other items. Um, Planning Commission also recommended disapproval unanimously for these uh, items as well. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions, comments, Oliver and Martin. Well, I've stated for months that I could not support a plan for this property unless the developers could comply with the conditions of staff and Envision Franklin. 
and I'm talking to uh, some very <laughs> close friends of mine in the audience tonight who will not understand why I'm voting the way I am, why I'm supporting this. Uh, I don't always vote the way my friends want me to vote, but you'll always know why I vote that way. Uh, but the developers have worked with these conditions and apparently they have succeeded in their efforts. I don't know what you're, I know the plan you're talking about, Joey. I've seen another plan. And the plan that I have seen complies with all these conditions. There are, there are some changes that have been made and they are, They have reduced the, the overall density from 166 units to 156. <coughs> they have increased the lot sizes on Franklin Road, ranging from a minimum of 56 feet up to 150 feet. There's a reduction of the building buildings and lots <clears throat> to 10 buildings on each side of Franklin Road. And I think they were uh, conditions that staff gave the developers. They have met these according to their plan. Now, my, my support will only be if the developers comply with every single agreement that staff gives them. Not agreement, that's not the word I'm looking for. Condition. If they don't meet those conditions, then I will not support it. If they will meet the conditions, I will support it. This is land that is going to be developed. And it's going to be. And I think if we have uh, somebody who is willing to meet the conditions, that we have to look at it. And they've done it. They've been working on this for years, I think certainly a lot of months and so I will support it if all of these conditions are met if I could just clarify really quick the plan being proposed um, is the plan that went to Planning Commission any sort of revisions new layout has not been reviewed by staff I'm so it would any sort of new overall <laughs> layout would have to go back to Planning you Commission and Historic Zoning <laughs> Commission for new recommendations. I understand that. Okay. And if it doesn't, Send if it, it doesn't meet with your recommendations, then I would not support it. So, to Alderman's, Martin's comment. I mean, what is the process? We we can't vote on the changes they've made since they went to Planning Commission, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Mm -hmm. When would that revised plan be seen? You'd have, it, really the the process is to send it back through the Planning Commission. They had a public hearing. Mm -hmm. They had the Planning Commission responded to a specific proposal. Um, if that's and we haven't seen what they're proposing, so and neither has the public. So to really have a transparent process and a process that gives people a chance to know what is being proposed, you'd have to send it back through for planning staff review, planning commission review, the public hearing that comes with it, and then come back to the board. That's the way. If we I could normally do add that. on here, okay. there Please. was even a neighborhood meeting associated yes. with this process that was well attended. Um, I do think, you know, we require mailed notices to adjacent property owners for the planning commission meeting. So changing the plan at this point really does necessitate going back to the beginning of the process where that was there was that much public involvement. At a minimum, it would need to go back to um, planning Commission mm -hmm. but there was also a recommendation from the historic zoning Commission on this item as well as a prior neighborhood meeting where this plan was presented so those are just factors to keep in 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 your mind and whether you want it to start back at Planning Commission or go back through the process with staff and the neighborhood meeting from the beginning other questions comments from the board we've got some public comment and uh, I'm going to uh, let Mr. Vogren speak, and then I'll call on the citizens who want to speak. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Board of Aldermen. Thank speak you for your time. Speak into the microphone. Sorry about that. Thank you for your time this evening. 
Uh, my name is Gary Vogan with Kaiser Vogan Design. Um, we understand that we are in agreement with all staff comments for this project. We are abiding by the comments that they have outlined. We've been working with planning staff, preservation, um, going through the process since October to start at a project that it's all been about the corridor along Franklin Road. The lot widths, the character, the lot uh, setbacks. What we are saying is that we agree with all those comments and we're re re willing to reduce the number of units from 161 to 156. We're willing to reduce a big house and a single family lot on the western track to get it down to 10 lots, um, ranging from 70 feet to 150 feet plus, which the planning staff has recommended. We're increasing the lot widths on the eastern side of Franklin Road, also based on staff comments and conditions. Um, so overall reduction of density, as they had mentioned as well. So meeting those staff conditions, we're just meeting those conditions and look for your support to do that. Um, and it's always about maintaining that character along Franklin Road. Uh, we wanna make sure that these units that we're proposing is a maximum of 10 structures along Franklin Road. And they range from 79 feet or 56 feet up to 150 feet plus, which planning has mentioned about that. Um, so we are in agreement with all staff comments, just wish to meet all those staff comments and present that plan to them to work through that process. So I'm not sure if we need to go back to planning commission, I just wanna verify that, but it seems like we're meeting all staff conditions based on those changes that Ms. Martin had uh, suggested as well, but also doing the traffic study, parkland dedication, creating an alternate trail <coughs> bypassing Harlesdale Manor uh, in that regards also. So I just want to bring that to your attention. That, but the intent is to really create that corridor along Franklin Road that everybody's talking about, reducing the lot widths, increasing the setbacks, and reducing the number of structures along Franklin Road. So that's the positive of it. And meet, that's what our intent is to meet those staff conditions. And, and we're agreeing with all of those. So that's why we're offering that, that, that plan change. So thank you. Mayor, Mayor, if I may, I mean, go ahead. My I'm understanding, uh, anybody, but I tend to agree with Margaret. If, if you know, when you go to planning commission and they have our staff gives you recommendations to do things, and if you do those recommendations uh, and you comply with their recommendations, then staff should, because you've complied with their recommendations, approve approved the plan. Um, now, whether it needs to go back to planning or not, it, it might just because they saw something yeah. different and they might want to have an opportunity to weigh in on that. But um, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if it needs to go any further than that. I, I, and that's my understanding, just what I, I've only, only know what I know right now, and that's what I heard, so. I can clarify the staff recommendations. Um, if a plan is close to being, or meeting the, the various recommendations and, and, and uh, regulations of our various documents, then we would recommend approval with conditions that those conditions can be met through the final round of revisions after planning commission. However, staff recommend disapproval because the amount of conditions and changes to the plan yeah, that. would need to have to go back to staff for a further review and then go back to planning commission because of that much change would be needed. Then that's what they need to do. Yeah. Can I just clarify something, um, Because in the staff, uh, recommendations for approval in the staff report it says if this plan moves forward and if you are agreement with all these staff conditions that that would be the next step to go before BOMA so that's the way we understand it we're meeting all staff conditions based on the staff report so that's the direction where we're looking to go before BOMA to your uh, vote mm -hmm. to move forward um, sure. Let's, uh, but the state law says that if the plan changes at all and how it's drafted it has to be seen by Planning Commission again and they have to vote yes or no on a recommendation if they still vote no it still has to come back to you and that's state law and we can't change that i also wouldn't know where to begin to make motions to amend no. this no, I yeah. to i mean even assuming we could or were willing i wouldn't i, I, mm. I just mm. i'm not an architect i'm not gonna mm. get a pencil out and fix this or a landscape architect, as the case <laughs> may be. <laughs> well, and, and no, if the, I, Mr. Mayor, if I might, I mean, I, I think what Sean says makes really good sense to me. So it was denied, period. What normally happens is it's approved subject to modifications. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, we need to have 
Planning Commission look at again and see if they would approve it subject to modifications or not again. And, and I'm uh, I like uh, Dana that if there's no way that we could tell uh, you, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this. That, that's, that's not our job to do that. So I, I, I think that's the best step. It slows you up a little bit, but uh, uh, then I think everybody would be more comfortable in making a recommendation or not that way. Yeah, we're all about agree meeting all staff conditions. That was the really intent to come before you to say, we're meeting all those conditions of approval and we'll modify the plan accordingly. And that's kind of our standard protocol. We want to meet with, in the middle with staff and work with them all. So we're looking to get that vote from you all to say, we're going to meet all those staff conditions and we're doing accordingly and make those revisions and get those back to site plan or back to development plan for the staff to review. So uh, they'll still have their chance to review it at development as we re make those revisions and resubmit it. So it um, gives no, us no, that opportunity. No, no. Uh, you, you got, You've got 15 people who voted. You, everybody who had the chance to vote on this voted against it. Right. That's seven historic zoning commissioners and eight planning commissioners. And I don't remember the last time I saw 50, a 15 to zero sweep out of those two bodies. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's not my job to give you advice, mm -hmm. but I think you'd have a better shot here if you weren't down 15 to nothing <laughs> agree. in the prior two Agreed. Meetings. Agreed. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Hogan. Did you want to make a clarification before I call the citizens? Uh, uh, please. Good evening, Mayor and Alderman. Um, we have a Development Services Advisory Commission that helps us with our processes and development process because we realize time to market is so important. And we spend a lot of time working with developers and Gary Dwight and his team do a wonderful job, provide a wonderful service to our community. But the expectation is that when a development comes into the community, it complies with our guiding documents, our master plans, and our development standards. And it's the choice of the design professional and the client whether they want to stretch that envelope. And as Joey had mentioned, our processes are designed to move projects along. That's why when a project comes in and goes in front of the Planning Commission or Historic Zoning Commission and yourselves, that it's approved with conditions because there's still a lot of engineering that needs to be applied to a plan. And when it comes before you for disapproval, that means that staff has too many outstanding questions. So be assured that our goal as staff is to facilitate investment in the community. But when a client and the design professor make a conscientious choice not to comply with the standards that are in place that you all approve, then this happens. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Heller, two minutes, please, and then uh We'll recognize uh, Jill Bergen with Heritage Foundation and then Mr. Sims. Yes, I'm Rod Heller, 1344 Carnton Lane. Uh, I, of course, uh, strongly support the recommendation of staff for disapproval. Uh, I thought the Alderman's comments of a 15 0 uh, lead, so to speak, uh, reflects this project. Uh, I can envision few projects that have as little citizen support as this. But it is because of the discussion we've just had that I'm here, because I think this project illustrates the problem right now with our development process. Uh, Alderman Barton said, we know this project is going to be developed at some time. And the inference throughout this has been if properly presented and ultimately you wear down uh, through conditions, you get a project. Franklin is such a unique community. So many of us moved here, not only because of its historic downtown, but because of the open space surrounding. This is the last open corridor. So a number of us have been trying to consider what alternatives might exist to this uh, existing program under which, uh, <coughs> as long as you're enough <coughs> compliance, ultimately the edge is toward development and investment, which would probably run counter to the preservation instincts of most citizens of Franklin. Accordingly, because this is a work session, 
I really came before you, not so much in this project, but to s state that a number of us have gotten together and are trying to come up with an approach which we will be presenting to the staff and ultimately to the city for a public-private approach partnership to acquisition of important development land. We're quite sympathetic to the owner of this land. Uh, it, it, obviously, it's not appropriate for any, that owner, whoever they may be, to hold the land indefinitely, expecting uh, ultimately to uh, receive some compensation. They deserve some compensation. There needs to be some mechanism in place. Other cities have developed mechanisms, cities that are less wealthy than this and have less of a preservation instinct. I know my two minutes are close to an end, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, but I would uh, urge this group, as they reflect on the kind of issue that Emmeline or Creekside, as we know it, presents, to recognize that we must, as a city concerned with the long term uh, and desire to preserve what we all regard as so critical here, come up with alternative approaches in which uh, a variety of ways using the federal tax laws, private contributions, and conceivably public support we can find a solution to the continuing dilemma we confront. This project should be preserved in a way that inures to the benefit, and most of you as the legacy, I think, would prefer open space or something rather than 156 instead of yeah. 161 <clears throat> units. Thank you. Come on up. Jill Bergen from Heritage Foundation. Thank you, Mayor and Alderman. My name is Jill Bergen. I live at 1235 Brentwood Point on the Franklin side. And I'm the Director of Government Relations and Advocacy for the Heritage Foundation. I'm here tonight to share that organization's stance on this request. Uh, it's for more than a half century, since it was formed in 1967, the Heritage Foundation has worked to preserve what's unique about our county. We've also been keeping a watchful eye on recent development and on your determined efforts to manage that growth. We appreciate and support the rights of property owners. We also appreciate and support the work of your professional administrative and planning staffs. With your direction, they've crafted zoning ordinances and, and guidance documents such as Envision Franklin to let any developer who works here know what's expected. In that Envision Franklin document, it says, the preservation of historic resources is of paramount importance to protecting Franklin's heritage and cultural identity. That's our organization's reason for being. We understand the value of this area. In fact, in 1996, the Heritage Foundation worked hard to secure Roper's Knob just over the ridge from Creekside to share its importance as a Civil War signal station. Our organization bought the property, then sold 22 acres to the state and donated the remaining 35 acres to the city for parkland. Yes, this is one of the last undeveloped areas near Cool Springs. Even so, back in the 1860s, it was a major throughway for Civil War troops who camped along Spencer Creek and walked the grounds of those nearby homes. The Creekside Tract is an almost untouched treasure that we hope can be studied by archaeologists and preservationists to reveal other Williamson County stories that we haven't heard. We can't support this rezoning request for Creekside because we believe the property calls for a zoning de designation with a more appropriate density and scale for that last rural downtown gateway. We stand ready to consult however we're needed, but our bottom line tonight is this. We at the Heritage Foundation believe your planning staff and you should be driving any major development changes that take place here, not home builders, because we all know from experience that once it's gone, it's gone. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Sams. Hi, my name's Alan Sims, 119 Lewisburg Avenue. Um, I, I definitely support the staff's recommendations on this. I attended the Historic Zoning Commission. I, I was there for that vote. I attended the Planning Commission as well. I was there for that vote. Uh, Marsha Allen, one of the commissioners in the Planning Commission, said the developers need to follow our guidelines. And you say they're following the guidelines that staff has given them, but the very first thing they're asking for is a rezoning. So they're not following what's already there. Um, so I definitely do not support this effort to rezone. Let's leave it a state residential and they can develop a state residential. So, so. Items 15, 16, 17 have to do with the uh, rezoning development plan parkland fees for um, 
property located uh, north of McEwen Drive and east of Interstate 65, 6100 and 6700 Tower Circle, West Franklin Park PUD Subdivision. <coughs> yes, sir. Um, good evening. Um, I'm Chelsea Randolph. Um, I um, am here to talk about 6100 and 6700 Tower Circle. This is a request for a rezoning of 32.43 acres with an associated development plan. Um, that development plan um, is proposing approximately 555 dwelling units consisting of rent and for sale multifamily approximately 311,216 square feet of office space and 8,900 square feet of retail for um, a site that is comprised of that 32.43 acres. Um, the um, Envision Franklin supports the proposed PD zoning for the parcel and the proposed uses shown within the associated development plan. Um, staff's recommendation um, it was uh, to approve both the development plan resolution and the rezoning ordinance. Um, the Planning Commission uh, voted to approve, recommend approval um, unanimously. And I'm available for any questions if you have any. Any questions or comments from the board? You come on up to what? While we're waiting on the board to decide if they have questions. Thank you, Lisa. Go ahead. So good evening. So again, on the on the Parkland side of things, as uh, she stated, there's 555 dwelling units, which is a total impact of 2.3 million. They're requesting 75% of public offsets for this development, which equals to uh, trails, pools, courtyards, pocket parks, uh, event lawns, and more. Uh, staff recommends approval. Have to answer any questions. Any questions from the board? So, uh, who's here to answer the questions about how many of these are for sale out of 555 <laughs> units? Good evening, Mayor, uh, Mayor and Board of Aldermen. Gary Vogren with Kaiser Vogren Design. Thank you. Um, yeah, so if you'd like to ask the question how many for sale? Um, uh, Northward Raven is our client, Jeff Furman. Uh, most of you met him. He toured, we had the opportunity to tour McEwen Northside, check out the units they're, they're building in McEwen Town Center. They're the developers of Franklin Park. They have committed to 75 dwelling units for sale. It is the middle building on the campus between the two existing Franklin Park 1 and 2 overlooking the amphitheater. So that has ground floor retail with those 75 residential for sale above. They're also committing to building the remaining residential units that are for rent to condo spec so that if that happens in the future, pending market demand, but that, that, that will also be part of that negotiation as well. Are they, uh, what's the construction? Are they stick or concrete? It'll be a combination of concrete and stick because there's both parking structures. Uh, it's an urban wrap scenario, so they're all four to five stories, pending grades so of four stories on the front side. If the grade falls off the back, be it to the floodplain or to the amphitheater, it'll be five stories in the back, so it'll be stick construction on top of that. <clears throat> Other questions or comments from the board? Okay. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Item 18, uh, resolution 2021-132, resolution authorizing the use of the competitive seal proposal procurement method for choosing the service provider for sanitary <coughs> sewer treatment program support services for a long term of award for the water reclamation facility division of the water management department. Wow. Any questions about that one? <laughs> we want to go get proposals. Would you like me to read it again? Go get them. Okay, we'll see you at 7. We're adjourned.